Hello everyone. Today is Friday, April 21st, 2017. I'm your host, Mike Lasecki, for today's webinar. I'm located at the Maricopa Community Colleges here in sunny Phoenix, Arizona. I'd like to welcome you to our topic, Advances in Transmission Electron Microscopy, brought to you jointly by the NAC Network at Penn State University and the NCI Southwest Initiative at Arizona State University with grateful support from the National Science Foundation. And thank you to all our participants for making time in your schedules to join us today to hear the latest about transmission electron microscopy. And by the way, this webinar will be recorded and you'll automatically receive a link to the recording. Before I introduce our presenter today, please turn your eye to the chat window. That's the upper part of your screen. And in that window, you can put in comments and ask questions of the presenters. We'll have time to address those questions as we run through our presentation today. It's now my pleasure to welcome Professor Tom Sharp from the Leroy Iring Center for Solid State Science at Arizona State University. Welcome, Tom. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. It's my pleasure. Um, I thought I would start out by saying a little bit about myself. So um, I am an electron microscopist. I'm actually a geologist and mineralogist. I study the detailed structure of minerals and how minerals change in, uh, in reactions in the deep earth and also during impacts. I am the director of the Leroy Iring Center for Solid State Science, and so I oversee lots of microscopes. Um, and I'm going to tell you about advances, but I'm going to start at the very beginning and explain um, how electron microscopy got started and some of the more traditional uses of it, as well as the advanced uh, capabilities. So let's go ahead and start. Um, the first slide just talks about improving microscope resolution. So the optical microscope had reached its limit of resolution about 100 years ago. And that limit is given by the diffraction limit or Abe limit, where, um, where the point to point resolution is related to the wavelength divided by numerical aperture um, and the um, aperture angle. So this was, this was the limit of what we could do um, until the electron microscope was developed. So a way to increase the resolution would be to decrease this value of lambda. And that can be done with electrons because we can accelerate the electrons at high voltage and they have then a short wavelength. So this was done by Ruska and, and Knoll in 19, 1931. And this is an image of the first electron microscope. Um, this is basically a cathode ray tube up here, um, some magnetic lenses and a sample, and then some sort of imaging screen to see, um, see images of the material. So this was a, a breakthrough, and it was a demonstration that you could achieve much higher resolution by using electrons. And we were off and running with electron microscopy. So some 40 years later, at ASU, we hired a person named John Cowley. He's in the background here in this image. And in front of him is Sumio Ajima, who was a postdoc at the time. And they're operating a commercial instrument, a Joel 100B. So this arrived in 1974, and this was a great instrument that allowed us to start doing high resolution TEM imaging at ASU. And John Colley was um, an expert in, in electron diffraction and microscopy, and he really started things going here at ASU. And Sumio Ojima was also, um, he did amazing things here as a postdoc, and has gone on to be um, a very big name in electron microscopy and material science. This is what a TEM looks like, a more modern TEM looks like. This is not what the latest instruments look like. This is a GL 2011, I believe. It's very similar. So this is, you can see the microscope column. The electron gun, the source of the electrons is up here. It's a type of a filament that's very hot. The electrons um, basically boil off. They're accelerated through an acceleration chamber here. They go through a series of condenser lenses. And then down here is the heart of the microscope. This is the objective lens region 
In this case, the sample is on the end of a side entry sample stage, a rod, and down below a series of intermediate lenses that then project the lens to a screen down here, a fluorescent screen, or underneath the screen, a camera system. In the old days, these were film cameras. Now they're all um, CCD type cameras. So the reason that these microscopes are so powerful is because electrons interact very strongly with matter. So this is just a cartoon showing a very thin specimen with an electron beam coming down from the top and going through that specimen. And the electrons are scattered in two different ways. The first is elastic scattering, which means no change in the energy. Um, and this is what, mostly what we use for diffraction. There's also inelastic scattering, and this is where the electrons lose some energy by promoting some sort of transition within the structure. So those energies that those electrons that lose energy are also passed through the sample, and we can use those to evaluate the chemistry of the of the material through a pro, through a technique called electron energy loss spectroscopy. Now, if those inelastic interactions knock core electrons out of the atoms, the recovery process produces X-rays, and we can collect those X-rays in EDS spectra. Um, and then we also have other, other sources of information too. OJ electrons from the very surface atoms of the material, secondary electrons also surface sensitive, and then backscatter electrons. So we use these, these, these signals up here mostly in SEM and then these down here, the elastically scattered and inelastically scattered in TEM. Now, one of the things that I really like to tell students is that TEM is really a diffraction technique, that the two things are absolutely coupled and you really can't do TEM without dealing with diffraction and, and thinking about diffraction. So here again is a microscope. And right here in this, in the objective lens area is then illustrated in a cartoon here showing the objective lens, um, the object that's being imaged, and the image plane, the back focal plane. So the electrons coming through the object are scattered, and they're scattered from every point within the object. Those scattered rays are then collected in the objective lens, and they're deflected to form an image in the image plane. But the plane where they cross over, it's right here, this is called the back focal plane, and this is where we get diffraction. So if I make an image of the image plane, it'll look like this. These are clay particles, kaolinite. Um, that's what the image of the material looks like. But if I project the back focal plane onto the screen, I get a diffraction pattern. And so in TM, we go back and forth between diffraction and image with the touch of a button. And we do it all the time. And diffraction is really important because what we see in the image is totally dependent on the diffraction conditions that we've created in the crystal. And we adjust those diffraction conditions by tilting the crystal to various orientations. Okay, so here's an illustration of what's known as diffraction contrast imaging. Again, this is just a simple cartoon, but each of the, so here's a diffraction pattern. This is a zone axis pattern. So we're looking down a direction with lots of, that's parallel to many planes. And each of those parallel planes is represented, or sets of planes is represented by a spot in the pattern. Each spot in the pattern has information about the entire sample in it. Now, if I wanna make a bright field image, I will use the center undeflected spot. So in this case, I believe it's that one. But in fact, if we do diffraction contrast imaging, we don't do it with a zone axis pattern. We tilt off the zone so we get something like this. So there's the central spot, and there's a spot that's diffracting strongly. It's in the Bragg condition. So we'll tilt off, and then I'll use an aperture. So if I want to make a bright field image, I'll put a small aperture over that central spot, the, the unscattered spot. If I want to make a dark field image, I'll use a scattered spot, and I can pick whatever spot that I want to, and the diffraction conditions that I set up then determine what I see in my bright field and dark field images. So this is an example of some work that I did um, some time ago 
on the mineral olivine, looking at dislocations. Um, this is a this is kind of an old technique, but it's a very important technique for imaging defects. So in the upper image, the upper image is taken with a diffraction condition that's illustrated right here. And you'll see these in these images right there. It says G equals 400. That's the diffraction vector used, and that's the orientation of the diffraction vector used. So in that image, we're seeing dislocations that have the Burgers vector 100. And you can see complex arrangement of dislocations. Down below, I'm using the same diffraction conditions. In this case, the vector is a different orientation, and it's illustrated um, down here. But these are other dislocations with the Burgers vector 100. But this is a this is a great way to image defects, and the contrast that you see is is very much dependent on the exact diffraction conditions that you set up in creating the image. So this is diffraction contrast image imaging. High resolution TEM is also known as phase contrast imaging. This is a little bit different, and in this case, we take the image down the zone axis of the crystal. So again, here is a diffraction pattern. Um, in this case, this is for olivine again. And looking directly down the zone, you have lots of spots that are excited. And what we do is we use many of those spots and recombine them in the image to form a high resolution image. So we don't generally use the entire pattern. We usually use a large objective aperture to limit the highest frequency um, features. So we'll put an aperture like this. And then the image we get is produced by the phase differences of all these reflections that we include in the image. So that's why it's called phase contrast. And it's an image of the electron wave that's exiting the sample. Um, because the diffraction is dynamic and there's lots of, of interactions and lots of um, diffraction back and forth between all the spots, the images themselves are, are complex functions of sample thickness and and focus. But this is how we get those high resolution images. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. This, these are some images I took a couple of months ago. And this is the mineral zircon. And I'm interested in the structure of the twin boundary. And the twin boundary, um, twins are formed by shock in zircon. So this is a very old mineral that was um, impacted in a, in a meteor impact event. But this is the twin boundary right here, this lighter region. The sample has been thinned and the boundary thinned out more than the rest of it. That's why it's light. And then down below is the diffraction pattern. This is the 111 zone axis used for taking this image. Now I'm going to zoom in. This is the same thing. And now you can see that you can see the lattice structure. So this, pop, this pattern of spots is is the intensity distribution within the lattice. And I didn't outline what the lattice, what the um, unit cell is, but this is subunit cell detail. And in this case, what you're seeing is local regions of damage from the, um, from the fission of uranium in the sample. And so I was interested in, in how that works in these, these materials. But this is an example of what <clears throat> the kind of image you get if you include the entire um, zone axis pattern, you get this, this pattern of um, lattice images or lattice fringes in, in the high resolution image. Tom, so, that's Mike. Uh, may I interrupt for a second before we go on to issues of improving yeah. resolution? A couple of questions that I'd like to bring forward. Um, Here's a question from our audience, and it has to do with the dark and bright field images. Are they sample dependent, or do you choose, let's suppose you have a sample, to take either a dark phase or a bright phase, bright field image? Or how does, how does one make that uh, decision on the type of imagery? Um, both images have, have very similar information in them. If you truly set up a two beam diffraction condition where nearly all the intensity is in the in the central spot and in one diffracted spot, those images will be complementary. Turns out it's very difficult to get that exact condition. So the dark field image will, might be a little bit better in showing specifically how that set of planes is influenced by 
the, the defects. And what you're imaging there is you're imaging the strain, the effect of local strain on the crystal. The strain then bends those, those lattice planes and affects the, the diffraction from those planes. And so in the case of that previous image, those light dislocation lines are where those planes were bent such that they're diffracting strongly. Mm -hmm. But you can set up whatever condition you want, and typically you would do a variety of diffraction vectors and look at how the contrast changes with different diffraction conditions. Good, thanks for that response. Um, another question um, it has to do with depth of field. What controls depth of field? Is, is that term used in NTEM? I'm not sure I'm, you know, my background myself doesn't really extend there, but do you think about depth of field? Um, Yes and no. We, it's, it's a very narrow depth and in TEM when we deal with focus and all of these images are taken with a certain defocus, with a negative defocus value. In other words, I'm focused above the sample a little bit and the contrast that you see in a high resolution image depends very strongly on focus. And so what you do is in the technique you, you go to a certain focus value called Scherzer. It's an optimum focus value for getting most of the, the highest amount of information from your image. And so there are sort of ways to do this on the microscope. You focus to minimum contrast, then you defocus um, a certain amount to get the optimal image. There's another, um, there was another question that said, I have access to a CM200, is that still useful? These images were taken on a CM200 uh, oh. <laughs> it's a very, it's actually a very nice microscope and still very, very useful. Oh, good. You know, uh, Tom, I also want to mention that joining us today as discussants are Bob Ehrman for Penn State and Trevor Thornton from your institution at ASU. Bob, if you have any comments at this point, you could unmute your microphone and I would call on you or you can pass as well. I will, I, I will just uh, pass at this point. Uh, I'll pass it on to Trevor, see if he has anything to say. Good, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Trevor, any uh, comments before we go ahead? Well, no, I want to continue. I'm learning a lot today. Thanks, Tom. Uh, me too. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that interruption there, uh, Tom. Go ahead and take us forward and talk about improving resolution. Yeah, feel free to advocate for our listeners because I'm not paying as much attention to the chat as I am to my uh, slides, so thanks. And that's correct, so thank you. So if we want to improve resolution more, we have one other option, or we have a couple of options. So here's the point-to-point -point resolution for high-resolution TEM, and this is this is um, Scherzer resolution, and it's mostly dependent on the wavelength to the three-quarters power and the spherical aberration to the one-quarter power. So an easy thing that we can do is to increase the accelerating voltage and decrease the wavelength, and that's what's illustrated here getting up into the very highest resolution in this range is from using very high voltage instruments. For example, this is a 1.2 megavolt instrument in Stuttgart. So these really high voltage instruments, um, this was the solution for a while. Here's one built by Hitachi. Um, and there are several problems with this. The first is that this microscope is giant. This thing is two stories high. So you need an amazing building and laboratory space to hold it. Um, they're very expensive. And then the problem is this. Although it gives you high spatial resolution, so here's an image from one of these microscopes, and you can resolve lattice fringes as small as half an angstrom. So these can get you past that sort of angstrom limit that had plagued microscopy. But if you look at the image, it's not a very nice image. It's the, con the, the structure is not very clear. And it turns out that most of most of the papers published using these microscopes have the word beam damage in their title because the materials don't stand up to these voltages very well. So yes, you get high resolution, but you damage your material, and so it's, it's not the best way to go. The other way to approach this is to go after the spherical aberration coefficient. Okay, so this can be done by an aberration corrector. So the modern microscopes have aberration correction. And this last part of the graph illustrates the effect of aberration correction. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that in the next slide. 
But if we can get rid of or reduce that spherical aberration coefficient, we then increase um, our, our resolution. Here's what spherical aberration is um, schematically. So all lenses have spherical aberration. And what it does is it produces a, a it doesn't allow the lens to focus to one spot. So for example, if I try to make a very finely focused spot, this is as fine as I can get it, this thing called the circle of least confusion. And that's because not all these rays will be focused down to the same position. That leads to what's known as the transverse spherical aberration. And similarly, the focal length or the focal position varies from, from here to here, producing this longitudinal spherical aberration. So it affects both focus of an image and creation of a small spot. And so we use aberration correction to address both of these, these issues. This is an illustration from the first aberration corrector that was um, produced. This was invented by Max Heider. Um, he wrote, this came out in 1998, first in Nature and then in Ultramicroscopy. And this is a device that's in the microscope. It's a series of hexapole and other lenses that allow you to correct for these aberrations, for higher order aberrations, including the spherical aberration. And as a test, here is an image of gallium arsenide. And this is the, um, the zinc blend or sphalerite structure. And this is looking down the 110 direction. And in this direction, those two spots, you see this, these pairs of atoms in the image, those are 1.4 angstroms apart. And what he demonstrated is with this corrector, you could now separate the atoms in these, these images. And so this was a great start. Um, since then, aberration correction has been developed and applied to lots of microscopes. Here's what it does in a scanning TEM. It allows you to make a very finely focused spot that's, that's finer and brighter than what you could do without it. So here on the left, this is a, and you can see it down here actually in profile, this is what the spot would look like from a field emission instrument. So the best, finest spot we could do at 100, 100 kilovolts without aberration correction. And here's what it looks like with aberration correction, much, much finer. Um, and brighter. And this allows you to get much higher resolution in scanning microscopes like scanning TMs or even at SEMs if you had aberration correction there. So we have invested in aberration correction microscopy here at ASU. And actually back in 2010, we were awarded funding from National Science Foundation to get a couple of aberration corrected instruments. We needed a special building to put them in because the the current laboratory spaces weren't good enough for these microscopes. So we actually built an annex to um, an existing building. And this, is, this building is called the Southwest Center for Aberration Corrective Electron Microscopy. And so here we have this very special building and it's got four bays for advanced microscopes. The first of these is the Joel ARM200F. So this is a combined scanning TEM and TEM with an aberration corrector. Um, this is called probe correction. The aberration corrector is up here between the gun and the sample region. So this aberration corrector is to make a very fine spot for scanning TEM. With the corrector on, our stem resolution at 200 kilovolts is 0.8 angstroms. Basically what that means is that tiny spot the diameter of that spot is less than the radius of a moderately sized cation. So that means we can get atomic resolution and scanning very easily with this microscope. Even at 80 kV, we still have quite high um, resolution. This microscope is equipped with EDS and also yields electron energy loss. So we can do analytical work at this very fine scale. So I'm going to show a couple examples of this. First, I should explain what STEM is. So in STEM, we use a finely focused probe and we scan through the sample and we collect a diffraction pattern. But we project that diffraction pattern onto a set of detectors and that the detectors then allow us to create a bright field image or a dark field image or so on as we scan. 
So similar to an SEM, we're scanning across the material, scanning, to basically collecting a diffraction pattern from each pixel. And then our series of detectors is shown here. If we just take the central intensity, that's a bright field image. But if we use an annular detector out here, we can do annular bright field or we can do low angle dark field, but we can, we can collect electrons that are scattered at a small angle, or we can use a detector way out here and collect electrons that are scattered to a high angle. And then by changing the camera length, we can basically adjust these angles and collect whatever angle we want. So here are some examples. This is from the, the ARM 200. The top image on, on the right is gallium nitride with two single atom layers of indium nitride. And it's hard to see them right there, but, but if I do a profile, a line scan across here, you'll see that this layer right here, which corresponds to right there, is brighter than the rest. So these types of images have intensity distributions that can be readily interpreted um, in a very straightforward way, that the indium actually scatters more than the surrounding surrounding gallium and therefore it appears brighter. Down here I have on the, the bottom images are a combination of a bright field image on the right, so the central um, little scattered electrons, and a high angle annular dark field image on the left. These are the high angle scattering um, electrons. And the great thing about high angle annular dark field is this. It gives you it gives you atomic number contrast. And so this is a little particle. This is a catalyst particle, epitaxially grown, epitaxially grown on zinc oxide. And this is a, a um, palladium zinc alloy. And the two different atoms show up as different contrasts. So the bright spots here are the palladium and the zinc are the, are the less bright spots. So you can actually see the different atom positions um, in these images in the, in the angular dark field. So this is, it's, it's an amazing technique and it provides images that are relatively easy to interpret in, in terms of which atoms are which and where those atoms are. This is actually easier to interpret than conventional TEM. So there's a question, does earth vibrate, do the earth vibrations affect the TEM? I got to address that. Earth vibrations would if there were an earthquake or something. The vibrations that affect it most are the vibrations from people around us, whether, you know, if, if you were on a street and the, a bus or a truck were driving by, you might pick it up. Or if there are a lot of people around, you would pick up those acoustic vibrations. The laboratory where these microscopes are is extremely quiet. It has about a four foot thick concrete um, slab for the foundation. And it's isolated from the other buildings. And it's very, very quiet, and very free of, of uh, vibrations. All right, so here is an example of imaging and interface. This is between two perovskite structures, lanthanum manganate and strontium titanate. And right down the center, you can see where, where that interface is. It's running right through here. And this is, a, this is a high angle annular dark field image. And so you can see columns of atoms. What's interesting here is we're going to use um, Eel spectra, electron energy loss spectroscopy, combined with STEM imaging to make a chemical map at this scale. So here's a chemical map of a portion of that image with the interface between. And what you see is you see the positions. There's This is the dark field image here. This is the map for titanium. So those are the positions of the titanium atoms. Those are the positions of the strontium atoms the lanthanum atoms, and the manganese atoms. And if we put all this data together into a spectral image, we have this, an image that shows where all the different um, cation columns are. So we can see where these metal atoms are in the structure, and we can look at the details of the interface. And you can see the interface is not completely sharp. There is a bit of disorder in that interface. But it illustrates that you can do chemical mapping and 
and analysis at the atomic scale. This is something that's really important for looking at um, defect segregation or um, impurity segregation to grain boundaries and, and defects and that sort of thing. The other microscope that we have, the other scanning TEM that we have, is called a Nyon Ultra Stem. And this is a monochromated stem, and this is a very special instrument, and it's, it's going to take me a little while to explain why this is. So when we do electron energy loss spectroscopy, the resolution in our spectra is dependent on the energy spread of the beam. So in, in TEMs, the energy spread is very, is very narrow. For example, in our ARM 200, the electrons are coming down at 200,000 volts, and the variation in energy is plus or minus about 0.45 volts. So the, the full width half maximum for that microscope would be about 0.9 electron volts. That's typical for a TEM. If you have a, what's known as a cold field emitter, which that's what this instrument has, you have a narrower spread, and it's better for doing yield spectroscopy. So let me describe this microscope a little bit. In this one, it's, it's upside down. The electron source is at the bottom. They travel up through here, and right here goes through a monochromator. This monochromator then sharpens the, or decreases the energy spread of the electrons significantly. And then it goes up through the sample and up to a camera and yield spectrometer up at the top. So this right here illustrates, this blue curve illustrates um, the typical energy spread for a cold field emission instrument. So this is the best you could do without the micrometer, and that's about 250 millivolts, milli-electron volts wide. The one in the center illustrates what this can do. So the monochrometer makes that, reduces the energy spread of that, of the um, incoming electrons down to on the order of 15 milli-electron volts. Um, this has a huge effect on, on the imaging and especially on um, electron energy loss spectra from this microscope. So let's see what this microscope can do. First, like the arm, you can image atoms. This is an example from Andre Krivenik. He's um, the, and he worked with several people at ASU. He was you know, he's a former ASU professor and he is a partner in the Nyon Microscope Company. The image on the left shows this is a hexagonal boron nitride, and these spots are atom positions. We have those sort of medium spots. We have fainter spots. Those are all atom positions. And you'll see that we have some brighter ones here like that, and some other that are intermediate. The thing about this is a this is a dark field stem image. Nice thing about these images is that the intensity tells you about what kind of atoms there are, you have. So if you do a line profile across this image, you'll see, and this is going through, for example, that very bright spot here and these other spots, you'll see down here in the, in the intensity profile that the intensity varies in a very systematic way and you can distinguish the different atoms. So for example, here we have two carbon atoms. This is in the X to X prime line. Then, then nitrogen, boron, nitrogen, boron, nitrogen, boron, so on. And then this really bright peak here, this is an oxygen atom substituting for, for nitrogen, and then we have boron and nitrogen again after that. If I go ahead and label them, I look at the intensity, the intensity of, the intensity of these um, positions, you can see that you can figure out which are which, are which. Uh, boron, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and then I can label them in the image. So this is an illustration of how sensitive these images are to different types of atoms and how we can image individual um, substitutions in such a structure. So the other thing that is possible with this microscope that hasn't been possible for before is to look at the look at the energy electron energy loss spectroscopy at very very low energies so because the zero loss peak is very narrow here it opens up a range of of spectroscopy that hasn't been available before and an example here is that we can actually see phonon states in materials 
which hasn't been possible before because the, in a typical microscope, the zero loss peak is much bigger than the entire range shown in this plot. So in this plot, you have, this is the tail of the zero loss peak coming down. But right here at 173 millielectron volts, we have a phonon in hexagonal boron nitride. And similarly, in cubic boron nitride, we have a phonon stated at 150 um, millielectron volts. This opens up the possibility to do vibrational spectroscopy in the TEM at a nanometer scale. You can also measure band gaps. You can look at states within band gaps. You can do all kinds of really interesting spectroscopy at basically at nanometer to atomic scale in this microscope. So here's an example. Um, this, is, this is an example of a carbon nitride. Um, C3N4, and it's illustrating a couple of things. So first, so here is the zero loss peak coming down, and here's the spectrum. Where the spectrum kicks up again, this represents the energy of the band gap. So we can measure band gaps um, in, in materials at this scale. But the other thing is, this, is, this particular um, example, the blue curve, is taken from putting the spot onto this sample and it's causing some damage in the sample that has resulted in some additional states in the band gap. And the states in the band gap are illustrated by these, these um, bumps right here. Sorry, that's the edge of the band right there. And then these are states within the band gap. If we put the beam off the sample right next to it, we get the same information. And that's what this is. This is called the aloof method. I can still measure the band gap. I can, the band gap is right there. But I can get that by putting the beam right next to the sample. It doesn't have to even touch it, but it'll still excite these transitions, these low energy transitions, and we'll be able to measure them in our samples. So I'm going to move on to another instrument that we have. And this one is, is also a very special one. This is the FEI Titan ETEM, Environmental TEM. This microscope is different for a couple of reasons. The main thing is that it is also aberration corrected, but now the corrector is below the sample. This is image correction. So instead of making the finest spot possible, we're taking the, the effect of, of the spherical aberration and its effect on focus, we're taking that out of the image. And this gives us very high resolution in, in high resolution TM. So for example, um, well, I'll tell you a bit about the microscope. This is a 300 kV microscope. We run it at 80, 200, and 300 kV. It has a very bright field emission gun. It has a monochromator that has, gives us an energy resolution of 150 milliEV, so about 10 times what the other microscope can do. Um, but it's still very good. And then it has this image corrector. And the information limit, in other words, the resolution we can get with it, is down to about 0.9 angstroms at 300 kV. And with the monochromator, we do even, even better. It also has EDX and deals for, for analytical work. Excuse me. Here's a, an image, atomic resolution image, using a, a negative spherical aberration coefficient. You can adjust it how you want with the corrector. Um, and you can see atom positions for aluminum, oxygen, and so on. I'm going to go on to the next example, though. Here is, is an example of low voltage imaging. So Sherry Chang, she's a research professor here who works with this microscope. She's very interested in nanodiamonds that are, and these nanodiamonds are formed by detonation. And nanodiamonds are very difficult to do in TEM because they're quite beam sensitive and they transition into a graphite type structure while you, or they can while you look at them. So she's been imaging them at 80 kilovolts with the monochromator on and you can see very nice atomic resolution images. Here's the lower mag. But atomic resolution images of these nanodiamonds. And what happens around the surface is, you, is they are surrounded by a graphite type layer like a one layer of graphene. She's been able to do the imaging here and show that this is not 
this is not from beam damage, but this is the surface state on these, these materials, so the surface structure. The most, one of the most interesting things we can do with this microscope, though, is the in situ work. Um, with an environmental TEM, we can expose samples to various gases, and we can watch reactions happen in situ. Hydration reactions, other reactions. Um, what one of our colleagues does, Peter Crozier, he's very interested in the performance of catalysts. And so he puts in metal catalyst particles. He runs reactive gases over them, measures how well the catalyst is working at high temperature using electron energy loss spectroscopy so he can see how well they're functioning while he images the particles at atomic resolution. And this is just an image of, this is an image of a um, particle with gas flowing through. And you can see the, the atomic structure of the particle. But what happens when the catalysts, catalysts are active is they sometimes change. They can grow or shrink. They can change structure and shape. The surface structure can change. But he can correlate any of these changes with changes in the catalytic function of the material. So it's a great way to study catalytic, catalytic reactions. And this instrument can be used for any type of uh, gas reaction people are in interested in studying. Tom, it's Mike again with an interruption. Yeah. Turns out we have a video, a short video that we snag from YouTube that shows a hydration dehydration reaction. Can I show that? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you can. Over. That's not a TEM video, though. That's an SEM. Oh, it is. Video. Oh darn. Yeah. Should so, I show it anyhow? Yeah, you, you can. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I just thought yeah, it's short, and I thought it maybe shows some of the capabilities here. I'm just adjusting the screen size. Just a moment. Okay, here we go. There's no sound with it. All right. Of course, it's an SEM. Yeah. But we can do the same thing in TEM. So I'm not sure what these materials are, mm -hmm. but they're exposing it to water vapor. Um, and the material starts to hydrate. In fact, you'll see coming in right now, the material is getting wet. Oh, right. And it's picking up the water, basically um, wetting the whole region. We can do the same thing in, in TEM. So there are. Um, for example, these, these hydrophilic type materials are very important in, in how they form clouds. And so people, right. for example, Peter Busick at ASU has done some work on, on aerosol particles and how they interact with water. And, but these things can, can be done in the TEM with um, and watching similar processes, but at higher resolution. But it is, it is very interesting that we can, and important that we can do these things. Well, thank you for the interruption so, there. Um, I'm going to take, just stop and ask for if there are any questions. I'm going to go on to the last section in just a moment, but we have a little bit of time. I'm wondering if there are any questions about the, about the high resolution TEM material that I've um, presented so far. Bob, do you have any questions from your side that you would like to forward to Tom? Sorry, I don't. I do not have any here. I'm wondering if uh, Trevor might. Uh, okay, Trevor, was... how about you? Well, Tom, there have been some questions about the building. Everybody addressed those. Uh, you addressed those, Trevor. No. Okay, I can, very good. I can add a couple more things about the building because the building is really important. One of the things that plagues electron microscopes around the world are stray electromagnetic fields. So, for example, if you try to set up a microscopy lab in an old European city and the tram is running by, you have to magnetically shield the room because every time the tram goes by, your, the field created will totally mess up your imaging. And there are a whole lot of labs that have to do that. At ASU, we've isolated things, that really isolated that building well, so we don't have to deal with that. When we put in the light rail in Tempe, the initial plan was to run it through campus, right next to campus. And our physics department realized what that would do to the research potential of the campus, and they fought hard to move it farther east. So everyone has to walk now a quarter mile 
from the tram stop to get on campus and so that we're able to continue to do microscopy and other other measurements on campus that we would be hard pressed to do with the train running through. Yeah, that's a nice example of everybody working together for the best outcome. So yeah, I remember it being built. Very impressive. Thanks, Tom. The other thing about that building, which is interesting too, there's metal in the walls and in the floor and the concrete, and all of that metal is isolated. There's no way that you can run a current through the walls. In many buildings, the, electro the electricians will just ground to to the walls and, and the floor, wherever. And there's current running through the building that interferes with these microscopes. And we basically eliminated any any ground loops in the building so there wouldn't be that interference either. OK, I'm going to move there's on. There's one other question that came in, and it had to do with, do you have any comments on low voltage TEM, the plus and minuses, or when you might use it? Oh, that's a great question. So we. <laughs> We, the low voltage capabilities are relatively new that we can now go to these voltages and get reasonable in, uh, results. And the scanning TEM works really well at low voltage. So, for example, with our neon, we often or commonly run it at 60 keV and we'll go down to 40 keV and still get atomic resolution. So, even though, so the resolution in those scanning images is not as strongly dependent on the wavelength as it is for the high resolution um, TEM images. So we, but we use low voltage for certain materials that, that are beam damaged by what's known as knock-on damage. And so if your sample is damaged by knock-on damage, you can go to low voltage um, and that helps a lot. The other thing you can do is use a cryo holder to reduce the rate at which your material damages too. But it's really to look at materials that damage quickly. Graphene is a good example. There's a lot of interest in two-dimensional materials like graphene and, and molybdenum disulfide and so on. Those things damage easily, and so we do those at, at low voltages. Um, and that that helps uh, quite a lot. Well, good. Why don't you go ahead and take us forward then? All right. So the final microscope I want to talk about is a brand new one. And I'm no expert in this, but I'm also very excited about it because of what it can do. So this is a FEI Titan Creos, and it has a Gatan K2 Summit single electron detector camera on it. This is for biology and has changed the world of biology greatly. If you want to know the structure of protein molecules or other important biological molecules, the way that you would study this in the past would be to crystallize the material and then do x-ray crystallography. And so in fact, most of the x-ray crystallography done and structure determination work done in the last 20 years has been in biology. Um, the problem with that is it may take years to figure out how to crystallize your material. And once you crystallize it, there's no guarantee that the structure of that protein molecule is the same in the crystal as it is in the cell. So people have done electron microscopy uh, cryo EM, where you freeze these particles, this material in ice, and look at them. And this is fine, but it's been difficult to get the resolution you need to solve the structures. And the reason for that is that these materials don't scatter electrons very much. The contrast is very low and they damage like crazy. It just destroys them to look at them. So you, what you do is you use cryo approaches and a very sensitive camera, and now we can do this. So this is just an image of a bunch of viruses as examples of the types of particles you can analyze. So what we do is we do single particle analysis of, of protein molecules. That is where you take thousands of pictures of these particles and then analyze the particles to, to work out the structure. But you can also do cryo-electron tomography of cell structures to get at structure of cell walls or various other features within, within cells. The reason why we use cryo is we freeze the material in an aqueous solution and you preserve, we hope to preserve the native conditions. So in other words, in your solution, you have these molecules that have the structure and form that they would have in nature, and we flash freeze them. 
and make vitreous ice and preserve that structure and form. So the vitreous ice is important because if you have crystalline ice, then you'd have lots of diffraction from your ice and you would see diffraction contrast in your images. So you flash freeze, so it's an amorphous H2O, H2O solid, and then you can look at the particles. Now in this cartoon, particles are illustrated as little vectors in various orientations. So they're randomly oriented. That's fine. What we do is we look at thousands or tens of thousands of these particles. And from there, we can piece together what the structure is. But the frozen state prevents dehydration. It helps preserve the particles and delays the effect of radiation damage on the material. So here's how, how it works. So we take an image, and this microscope is, is really like an imaging robot. You can put in 11 samples at one time. You, you need to do some screening first so you know that you have good material. But you set this thing running and it'll image, like I said, thousands or tens of thousands of particles. Once you have these particle images, you work with software to register those particles. So for example, if this, if this vector represents one of the particle, an image of a particle, we can then compare it to other images and translate and rotate those images until we get registration in and create a set of images um, of the same orientation of the particle. From there, we can average and get a better structure image from that orientation. If we have many, many orientations of particles, we can now start considering how they are related by the other rotations and basically create a tomographic model of the structure. And so in the end, and this is, this is hard to see here, but in the end you come up with some model for this particle that has the atom positions in it with a resolution of two to three angstroms. This has revolutionized biology because you no longer have to figure out how to crystallize the material. The particles are in their more native state and you can do things that have not been done before. And so this type of microscopy is, is catching on very quickly across the country. And there's a very strong demand for it right now. So we're very excited to be involved in it. Um, that is where I'm gonna, going to stop. We have a couple. There... We do have some questions, Tom. Um, do, does it take a long time to acquire those images, those, those uh, cryo images? Um, no, it, it, well, I should say something about the camera. So this, these detectors known as single electron detectors are a technology where you can run them in a mode that, that can count every electron that hits them. And what you do then is you use very low electron doses, electron doses on the order of two electrons per square angstrom per second, that sort of thing. But you can collect that information and you can average it and you can get the imaging, the images that you need without damaging the material. So it's really a way of getting around the damage problem. And these cameras are very, very fast. So they take lots and lots of frames per second. And then you can take out the motion and you can remove the damage. So when you first start imaging this material, there'll be a fair amount of motion as the ice and material flexes in the beam. But you can eliminate the motion part and then you can, and you can basically remove the motion between frames and analyze the, the material. There's, There's a question, a question about magnetic materials. Right, right. Okay, so magnetic materials are a problem because, in a way, because they will deflect the electrons and they can, they can be a problem, but there is a way of looking at them that's very powerful. Um, it's called electron holography. In electron holography, and I didn't put a slide in for it because I'm no expert in it, but in electron holography, we use a biprism to split the beam and we look at these materials and from this holographic image, we can extract amplitude and phase and use this information to map out magnetic domains in magnetic materials or electrostatic domains in materials. And it's a really, it's a great way to get at some details of, of both electronic and magnetic properties. Um, in that case, what we do is we turn off the objective lens 
the objective lens is a very strong man magnetic field on the sample, so it would obviously change the sample. So in that technique, you turn the, the objective lens off, you load your sample, and you use the corrector as the image forming lens. Here's a bit more of a general question that came in by email. Um, where do you see this going? How, where's the future for this? I mean, it's moving pretty fast. This new technology is pretty stunning. Uh, what do you see happening in the future? So I think that the high resolution TEM will have a, a very big effect on two dimensional materials and, and electronics and so on that have very small amounts of you know, single atom layers and, and, and so on, be, allowing us to look at smaller and smaller structures. Um, so I think it'll have a big effect there. Also, this the cryo-EM is going to not only change our understanding of biology, it's going to change the way we do medicine. This technology will be used in, in fighting disease and evaluating what's really happening um, in, in biochemistry. And so I think there's some amazing advances that will be coming soon because of this new technology. And a lot of it has to do with advances in detector technology and, and so on. Um, but does, so does the, the, the significant cost of the crowd, do you think that becomes a barrier or is that barrier going to come down too? Uh, these microscopes are expensive. There is competition between the companies. Right now, FEI is, is doing very well with their cryo microscope. Um, it's expensive, but biological research is expensive. To spend years trying to crystallize sure. this material and analyze it is also a very expensive proposition. Um, one of the things that we're excited about is there's a significant interest in this from industry. So the pharmaceutical industry would love to have this kind of information about a variety of things so there there is definitely an industry use of these um, microscopes and we also we work with industries um, with our facilities too it's a way of, of offsetting some of our costs excellent let me turn to um, Tom to our colleague at Penn State Bob do you have a cryo unit there at Penn State you know, I do not know whether we we do in our um, we have an FEI. I'm not sure or a Titan, but I'm not sure whether we do or don't. To be honest with you, because we're not I'm not in the MCL facility. We're in the education uh, arm through the NSF ATE. So I know we have a, a several TEMs, but I'm not sure uh, whether we have the cryo unit or not. But now you want it, one. Now we do yeah. absolutely without yeah. a doubt. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> These yeah. are cool devices. If you do have one, it's likely in uh, in biology, and not necessarily material science. Oh sure. At ASU, we put it with our material science microscopes mm -hmm. because we have the the history of of running microscopes, and we have the facility. It's in our fancy building, and so we are expecting performance of the microscope to be as good as it can possibly be in that. In that environment, I'm going to go check with my colleagues in MCL this afternoon because they actually have a shared facility that's bio and materials. That's a shared materials characterization lab uh, for for yes. uh, various uh, areas, basically coming together as a central facility. You know, Bob, what I liked about Tom's presentation today, I already can see using some of those earlier slides to help them understand sort of like the evolution of of this technology i thought it was it was very interesting i took some real notes there absolutely absolutely i think it, it's a it was a great uh great introduction and and uh awesome amount of uh uh information shared today thank you so much tom good You're trevor welcome, uh, thank you again for for co-sponsoring this webinar any closing comments for uh for dr sharp well i'd not sure whether Tom had the chance yet, but we should give a shout out to his facility. It's it's available to people around the country to use. So Tom, maybe just a final word about how the Leroy Iring operates as a multi-user facility. Okay, so yes, that's that's correct. Our facility is open to anyone at ASU and off campus. So we work with um, external people all the time. Um, we are open to anyone who has problems to solve. So if there are people out there who would like to do advanced TEM techniques, you can contact our, 
our facility and and set up a visit to to do some work so we're yeah we're very open to outside users and we do a lot of collaborative work excellent well thank you uh friends that we're right at the top of the hour perfectly on time tom thank you very much for your your presentation again and colleagues that have joined us from around the country and around the around the world really i want to let you know that this uh, link to the recording and slides will be automatically sent to you and you can always go to nanoforme.org or ncisouthwest.org and see our prior recorded webinars this will conclude our webinar webinars in the series for this year but next year please tune in again as we'll bring you more interesting webinars featuring everything from unique technologies like today to ways to incorporate nanotechnology into your own programs let me uh, end today by thanking Tom again. And colleagues, I'm now going to put up a brief survey. You'll see it on your screen. Take, take me just a moment to launch it here. Here it comes. So if you would take just a moment to respond to these brief questions that you'll see in another browser window now, uh, that'll help us improve this webinar series. That officially concludes our webinar today. Thank you again, Trevor, Bob, for joining us, and Tom again for your insightful presentation. Goodbye, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Thompson.